Well, as we continue on through the month of May, each year at this time, we take a time out from whatever we're doing, and we focus on the importance of prayer. It was the, di- the, the disciples who said, Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't say, teach us to teach, teach us to preach. They said, teach us to pray. There was something different and effective about the way that Jesus preached. This church was birthed out of a prayer group at its beginnings, and we've always established that this church's success will depend upon the prayers of the people. It is often the prayer group that dies first in a church, the the habit of prayer among the people that is first to go, and then it is a slow, grueling death after that. A church that is not relying on God is not praying to God, and a church that does not rely on God. Any people uh, who do not rely on God will eventually fail in their endeavor to do anything of eternal impact before God. So we want to be known as a church that prays. I want to be a person whose prayer life is effective, is fulfilling. I don't want to just always walk around guilty about the the fact of my prayer life, that I'm not satisfied with it, but I'd rather have a fulfilling prayer life. And I've gone through a, a, a journey of my own when it comes to learning how to pray with God. Now, last, let's see, last time we were in this series, two weeks ago, we, we described what casual prayer was, right? Casual prayer is prayer of the mouth and not of the heart. All right, and I want to establish that this morning. In fact, I'm going to call those people, those who struggle with this, uh, we're going to see it demonstrated in the passage we're at today uh, in, in the book of Matthew. Uh, we're going to be looking at sleepers. Matthew chapter 26 is where we'll be at here this morning. And sleepers are those uh, who, are, who are praying perhaps of the mouth, but not from the heart. They're people who, have, uh, who struggle in this area to the degree that there really is no prayer life. I think God's people have always wrestled with the sin of prayerlessness. And it's an evidence that we're, we're not relying on God. And we want, a people, we want to be a people who is successful in our prayer life. Uh, we, we talked last time about how so many of the great awakenings and so many revivals have been marked by breakouts in prayer, real prayer, prayer that comes outside of uh, this kind of casual prayer that we're talking about. Uh, in fact, it was called travailing prayer by many of the authors uh, back in the times when these awakenings happened, when these revivals broke out. They described it as though uh, someone was crying out to God as as though someone saw a house that was on fire and their loved ones were inside. That was the kind of energy that was in their prayer life. It it wasn't just this extremely uh, laid back, almost lazy, ritualistic, whatever words come out the same. No, when, when God poured His Spirit out on His people and the people began to respond through prayer, they began to see the need for God to move in their communities. They began to have a burden for the lost people uh, in their communities and in their families. And, and, and they began to cry out that God's will would be done uh, on earth in, in their dwelling. It changed the way that they prayed. So we want, like the disciples, to say, God, teach us how to pray like this. Teach us how to have a powerful prayer life. So let me define this morning travailing prayer. We know what casual prayer is. Casual prayer is this prayer of the mouth but not of the heart. Travailing prayer is the cry of the soul. It's the cry of the soul that has been awakened to an eternal perspective. This is the opposite of a sleeper. These people are very awake and aware of the spiritual reality that is going on before them. And we're going to see both in the text here today. We're going to see sleepers, and we're going to see those who are very much awake to what God is doing, and we're going to see the difference in their prayer lives. The prayer is just a symptom of what's happening on the inside. So here's what I'd like to do. Uh, I want to read through this passage in its entirety. Now, I have not put that up on the screens. I'd like you to just listen to the story, and then we'll go through, and I'm going to pick out a a few key phrases from this passage that I want you to to think about. So first, 
Uh, just relax, sit back. I'm going to read this to you starting in verse 36. L- just listen to the scene, kind of put yourself there and, and watch what's happening with this dynamic of Jesus and his disciples. Uh, they've had the Last Supper now. Jesus is getting ready uh, to be betrayed, betrayed, to be crucified, uh, to be accused unjustly, ultimately to have God's wrath poured upon himself and to die on the cross. He's, he's in this pivotal moment where heaven is about to launch its greatest attack against the kingdom of darkness and its ultimate defeat of the kingdom of darkness. So this is where Jesus is at, very aware of his spiritual surroundings, and his disciples have lost track of what's going on around them. Verse 36 of Matthew 26, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42, again the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass until I drink, let your will be done. And again he came out and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went and he prayed for the third time, saying the same words again, Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. This is the scene of the Garden of Gethsemane. And we can take from other accounts in the Gospels, this was the most intense prayer ever recorded of Jesus. He had terrible sweat dripping down off of him like blood. This was an intense time for him, and we'll get into a little bit of why that was. But I want you to see the difference of the prayer life in this instant between Jesus and his inner three, his best three friends. They keep falling asleep and he's travailing in prayer to almost the point of death. What is the difference? And unfortunately, if I were to say which style of prayer more resembles your prayer life, more Christians can relate with Jesus' three best friends where we're almost drifting off to sleep versus having the, t- the kind of intensity to our prayer that Jesus was demonstrating. How do we get out of this? Let me point out a few things for us to take note of. First of all, in verse 36, Jesus says these words, sit here while I go over there and pray. Now, An eternal perspective causes us to pray while others are content to stay. We're going to see that right here in the Scriptures. Fill that in in your worship folders. An eternal perspective will cause some to pray, but those who miss it, they're going to be content to stay right where they're at doing whatever they're doing. When Jesus says, sit here while I go over there and pray... It would have been good because this was late at night. There was a lot going on. Jesus has already said and explained to the disciples, I am going to be betrayed tonight. This is going to be a rough night for me. My death is coming soon. Jesus was telling the disciples this, but they're, now they're just getting tired. Jesus recognizes this, so he just takes his inner three best friends and he says, listen, I just, I just want you to be with me. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to pray. I, I mean, I've got to get myself through this night. I've got to be, make sure that I am spiritually prepared to endure what is about to take place. Now, I, I wish that the response in the Bible was that one of the inner three disciples said to Jesus, we're not going to stand here. We're not going to sit here. We're not going to stay right here. We're going to come and pray with you, Jesus. This is a difficult night. You're on the precipice of some of the greatest challenges you're ever going to face. Your ministry is coming uh, to that pivotal point. We're not content to stay. But that's not what happens here. But at least their presence is there. And Jesus takes comfort in that. 
as he now takes the time to begin to pray with great intensity, with, with travail before the Father. See, sleepers fail to grasp the importance and the significance of the eternal. They miss it completely. Jesus had been talking and talking uh, about this, about what was, what was happening in his ministry. And yet, if we follow in the other Gospels, between the Last Supper and this moment, not a lot of time has taken place. Their conversation is talking about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Like they're still not getting it. They're still missing the point. They're not in an eternal perspective. They're in the here and now. As Jesus takes his throne, who's going to get to rule with him? Will I get to sit on his right hand or his left? Who's going to be the greatest among us? It had to be driving Jesus nuts. Because Jesus understood that the eternal picture here was so much bigger. But sleepers will miss that. And we're going to see that, that term twice in this passage. In verse 40, it says that Jesus came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And in verse 43, again, he comes to them, he finds them sleeping when they needed to be praying and even warns them about this. When we're not awake to the significance of the eternal that's happening around us, we will simply not be moved to pray. When we are so rooted in the temporal, in the physical, and what we can touch, taste, and feel all around us, and we're missing the picture of what heaven is doing, what God's, what plan is unfolding before us, we won't be a people who are moved to pray. We must be aware of what is happening around us. We must take the cues of our teacher, Jesus, so that we won't miss the significance of the eternal while we are living in the temporal. Let me read a phrase from verse 38. Jesus says, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. My soul, this is, this is, this is the, the extent of his prayer right now. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. See, travailing prayer takes us beyond well, I ought to pray. That's where the sleepers were at. That's where Peter and the two sons of Zebedee are at right now. Well, we ought to be praying right now, but I am so sleepy. It is so late at night. But Jesus, who was aware of the eternal surrounding, he, he was in a place where he, not ought, he should not ought to pray. He had to pray. To survive the next moments, he must pray. And it says here in verse 38, if we were to continue to read, Remain here and watch with me. This time, Jesus doesn't tell his inner three uh, to, to stay over there while he prays. He says, now I want you to come with me. Stay here. Pray with me. But we know from the story that we just read, it doesn't happen. Their eyes are heavy. They're so tired. Because their souls are unmoved by what's taking place in the eternal realm. You know, we, we have to get to that place, church. If, if you find that you are, you really struggle to get motivated to pray with meaning, I hope some of you, many of you, have taken the challenge 10 minutes a day to pray through the month of May. That can really jumpstart the habit of prayer in your prayer life. We can get into a place when we begin to spend time with God, then we learn to talk with Him. Something happens when we break out of the casual prayer where we pray before meals, maybe a quick prayer before bed, but we actually start to spend a little bit longer. I find that 10 minutes is typically a little bit longer than most pray, and it begins to test us. Well, how do I just, do? I'm out of things to say. I'm out of things to ask for. How do, I, how do I just talk with God? How do I just spend time in His presence? It begins to stretch us a little bit. We, we have to understand that when we start to grasp what God is doing in the eternal, we're, we're teaching through the book of Revelation. We're, we're a people that are supposed to understand that Jesus is on the precipice of His return. That everything in this world is going to change and change quickly. And we're in a generation, a very special generation, that I anticipate to see the return of Christ come. And yet, the church is accused of sleeping. It's not doing much of eternal significance. It's not praying like Jesus our King is about to come back. Even we as people, we struggle. 
Because if our hearts have not really truly latched on to the kingdom and latched on to this, this opportunity where our eyes are open and we understand what God is doing and how he is moving, we're going to be lulled to sleep because we're content. We don't feel the imminence of what is taking place. I've had the, the opportunity in, in my life, and I, and, I, and I don't share this to be boastful in any way, but I, as my prayer life has grown, I have a time each day about 1 o'clock that I look forward to. It used to be I had to pray or I ought to pray or I should pray. And I didn't know what to say. And it was, it was kind of like my brain would just disengage and it became, it, it became laborious. It was a discipline. But as I continued to spend time with God over prolonged periods of time, not just five minutes, not just ten minutes, but it grew in its time to an extended period of time, my, my outlook on prayer completely changed. I began to look forward to being able to pray, to get to pray, to get to that point of the day where I'd marked off, okay, this is when God and I get to, to go do our thing together, to begin to talk together. And, and I, I began to learn what it meant to, to pray the scriptures and, and you know, things that I'd been reading in the Bible, begin to ask God to do those things in, in my life and just to talk to him like, like you would talk to a friend. And I, in my own style and in my own way, I've learned how that works well in my life. I typically walk around. I walk around our property here at the church during that time, or if it's nasty out, I'll, I'll come in here, walk around and, and talk with God. And the more that you do this, the more natural prayer becomes. And you're going to find that the more natural it becomes, God begins to speak back to you. He begins to speak to your heart. I've learned to always carry a pen and a, a notepad with me because some of my deepest insights, whether it's to a message on a Sunday morning or a decision that I need to make in my family or with the church, they come in those times, almost always. That's when God impresses on my heart. It's uncanny. God speaks to his children. He speaks to his friends. But we have to take the time to speak with them. We have to learn how to do that. There is nothing wrong with coming before God and saying, God, I'm going to spend 20 minutes with you today, 30 minutes to, to, with you today, and I want you to just teach me how to pray. God will. You'll find very quickly that the dynamics change when you go from a two-minute prayer to a 20-minute prayer. But do it. Take the time to pray. Leonard Ravenhill uh, loved to listen to his preaching and I uh, love to read some of his, his old books. But, but he was a man who believed in prayer. He was a man who believed in revival. And, and he said this about the church way back when. He said, when it comes to the matter of New Testament, Holy Spirit-inspired, hell-shaking, earth-breaking prayer, never has so much been left by so many to so few. And that is the general consensus. You can go to churches all around our nation and you can look at the preaching time and the prayer time and the two don't compete. And yet it's interesting, I find that Jesus did His greatest work around His prayer time. His disciples were most enamored with Jesus' prayer life. Even over His teaching. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Let me drop down to verse 39. Now Jesus, intensifying his prayer, falls down on his face, praying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You know, it's worth noting that Jesus now has changed his posture. This is kind of unfamiliar to us. This, this posture in prayer. We know the be seated in prayer. We know the uh, kneeling maybe by your bed in prayer. Standing in prayer. When's the last time you laid down on the floor and laid before God and prayed? That's the way Jesus is praying right now. Not a very common form. He's in a, he's in a posture of complete surrender. There's no one posture that is correct as we pray before God. 
But for Jesus, in the in matching the intensity of his prayer, is now laying before God. And he, and he says those words. He's seeking God's will. Father, if it be possible, he's sharing his heart, father to son. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. You ever prayed that prayer before? I have. I wasn't going through the same thing Jesus was about to go through, but I've seen, I've seen things line up in my life and thought, uh-oh, I don't want to go through this. Here it comes. Here comes the mountain. Here comes the circumstances. Here comes the challenge. God, I, I'm not built for this. I don't want to go through this. This is going to be painful. How about we skip this part of the journey? Please take this away. Change my circumstances, God. That's... Hey, Jesus is fully human right here. Let's not forget. Fully divine, but fully human. And in his humanity, he's just talking as a son to the Father. God, if I did not have to go through this, I would be way okay with that. But then in his surrender, after asking this cup to be passed from him, he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see, travailing prayer seeks God's will over our own will, over our own desires. Boy, that's, that's a tough one to get. This is a unique kind of prayer. Don't we pray to get what we want? <laughs> that's typically why we pray. Oftentimes when I'm driven to prayer, I want something. Maybe I want to skip some consequences that are coming or a difficult part of my journey. Maybe I have a desire in my heart. But typically, it's a desire that drives me to prayer. But travailing prayer can go so much farther beyond that. Travailing prayer is rooted in the eternal. It has a broader perspective. It understands that there is importance to the purposes of God. So travailing prayer is able to pour the heart out before God and yet at the end say, God, your purposes trump all that. All right, I needed to talk to you. I needed to get this off my chest. I needed to let you know how I feel. But I also want to assure you that whatever your purposes are for me, I'm going to be okay with that. This marks the prayer of the mature in Christ. I'll, I'll give you a promise. If your prayers are marked with God, this is what I want. And if you don't give me that, I'm not going to be okay with that. You're still an infant in Christ. You're still figuring out the very basics. that You, you haven't quite gotten the eternal yet. You haven't figured out yet that this world isn't revolving around you. You have not quite figured out yet that God does not exist that He might bring all your desires to pass, though He's interested in your desires as a father to a son or daughter. But God's purposes are not tied into your happiness whatsoever. And the mature in Christ are able to pour out their heart to God in fully open and honest ways, and then, before God say, and whether you grant this or not, you have my full allegiance. Because you granting my request has nothing to do with my allegiance to you. I wonder if you can say that this morning. If your allegiance to God does hinge on Him granting some request of yours, then you do not have an unconditional love for God. You're not following Him in the way that you said you signed up for this. When we follow up for God, we are dying to ourselves. We are laying all that down. We follow Christ no matter the cost. We no longer belong to ourselves. We belong to Him. And our lives are to be expended to maximize His glory, no matter what that takes, in pleasure or in pain, in sickness or in health. We are here for His glory important followers of Christ that you understand that because if God in your mind exists for your happiness rather than you for his glory you have some hard lessons coming 
really difficult lessons coming. And bank on it, God's going to teach you those lessons. Because God understands what's best for you is that you fulfill His purposes and plan for your life. Sometimes it's costly. Sometimes it's very enjoyable. But we must understand that this is not about us. It's our privilege to live for the Lord. One author has, has helped the understanding and our approach to God this way. It was Daniel Henderson. Uh, he was a professor back at Liberty University uh, that, I, that I was able to sit under for a little while. And he, he talked about the importance of coming to God and seeking His face rather than seeking His hands. We talked about this a little bit on our National Day of Prayer. In our infancy, we seek a parent's hands all the time. My children, when they want to come to me, they typically want something from me. They're seeking my hands. Daddy, can I have a piece of candy? Daddy, can I have a snack? Daddy, can you take me down to the park? I want to go play. Daddy, can you open the garage? We want to ride our bikes. Daddy, can we play a game? They, they seek my hands, and it's my joy to do many of these things. I, I want to, to bring them happiness. But there's a difference as the relationship matures over time between seeking someone's hands and seeking their face, coming to have a conversation with someone when you don't need anything from them. Daddy, I just, I just want to spend some time with you. I just want to sit and have a good conversation with you. When we seek someone's face, it's a much different feeling than seeking someone's hands. In fact, it can wear you out. If you have someone in your life who's constantly seeking your hands, they're a great friend. They always show up when they need something. Even if they're blessing you, there's a string tied somewhere. They need something. You know how it can wear you down a little bit when someone constantly seeks your hands. They just want your relationship for the stuff for what you can do for them. As we mature in our faith, Christians, we must learn to seek God's face. To come to God, whether we need or want stuff from His hands or not. To simply enjoy our friendship and our relationship together. We need to learn to seek God's face. Those who travail in prayer have the benefit of experiencing that. Those who only know casual care or prayer will not experience those times of seeking God's face, but remain in infancy and just always seek His hands. Now, in this case, Jesus is asking something from the Lord. Let this cup pass from me. I think it's, it's interesting to point out what the cup is because my brain just naturally says, well, the cup, He's getting crucified here very, very shortly. I don't think He wants to be crucified. Well, certainly, He does not want to go through that experience. But there's much more to that than this because we can look in places like the Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Revelation. They all talk about the cup. And it's not crucifixion. It's the wrath of God. The cup in the Bible is the wrath of God. Jesus is sweating in the Garden of Gethsemane not because He's afraid of the Roman soldiers. Understand that, church. He's not quivering and shaking because he's afraid of soldiers. He is not afraid of the soldiers. Jesus understands he is about to drink from the cup of God's fury that has been built up over the ages from the wickedness of mankind. A crucifixion from Roman soldiers and the cup of the fury of God's wrath can't even measure on the same scale. It was the cup that Jesus feared. It was the cup that was causing him agony. He was not a coward, but he understood the reality of what was about to take place on that cross much more beyond physical pain. And yet he submits himself, not as I will, but as you will. And I love this. Jesus requests to be spared, and the Father accepted Jesus' prayer without granting it. He listens to Jesus. He hears this prayer, and yet He does not grant it. It's the Son's loving request and a Father's loving wisdom. They're going together. The request will not be granted. As a result, Jesus will endure 
our condemnation on the cross. That's why we can claim today from Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the condemnation's already been poured out. Jesus took it all. Verse 40, here we have the disciples sleeping again. Jesus says, so could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The absence of travailing prayer reveals the condition of the sleeping disciple's heart. I'm saying this to you, church, to help you gauge where you're at in your spiritual walk. If you lack travailing prayer in your life, the kind that goes way beyond just moving the mouth, but it's the cry of the soul to God, length, time spent with God that goes beyond just two or three minutes, but times that you're really engaging deeply with the Father, if, if you are lacking that, it shows the condition that you are among the sleeping. Have you ever been frustrated as you look at the churches across America? You see the wealth that we possess. You see the need around the world to get the gospel out. And you think, then you see what the churches are doing with their money. And you think, what are, what are we doing? Or you, or you see believers in a church that are completely unmoved. They've got a lost community all around them. All they want to focus on is making sure that things are comfortable inside. Don't rock our boat. we got a good thing going here. And we accuse the church of what? You're sleeping. Wake up, church. There's work to be done. But I would tell you, church, that if you are a believer and you have no record of travailing prayer in your life, that you're among the sleeping. That you would have been no different than these disciples in Jesus' greatest hour of need who couldn't get past their heavy eyelids. Jesus asked them, could you not watch with me one hour? Couldn't you pray with me for just one hour? The sleepers fail to grasp the significance of the eternal. It's abstract. All they, they know is what they can see, feel, touch. The eternal escapes them. You know, you can sit, church, under the greatest teaching available and sleep. Look at the disciples. Look who their teacher was. It doesn't get much better than that. And here they are sleeping when it's time for them to pray. On the eve of heaven's greatest sacrifice and greatest victory over the darkness, these disciples completely miss the eternal. Well, how about you? Because it feels to me like we're about to do a repeat. We look at these disciples and think, how could you have missed this? I mean, how could you have slept through this? Don't you understand what Jesus is going through? Don't you understand the significance of the time that you're in? And we're frustrated. I'm frustrated reading this. Jesus is asking you, Jesus himself is asking you to pray for him with a, for an hour. You can't do that? Don't you understand the significance of the moment? Christ will be crucified tomorrow. And then we look at ourselves. The trumpets of heaven are poised and ready to be blown. Christ is ready to come back and return for his bride. And while we sit here and wag our fingers at the disciples, recorded in Matthew 26, we sleep. I think God is calling us to examine ourselves in this. And Jesus explained to the disciples what the problem was. Hey, the Spirit's willing, but your flesh is so weak. The disciples were in danger of failing here, and Jesus is telling them why. You're operating in the flesh. Your spirit is willing. I mean, how, how many of you have a willing spirit inside of you? I would love to have a vibrant, powerful time each day of prayer with God. I doubt there's very many believers in here that just roll up their fists and say, I don't want to do that. I mean, we want to please God, whatever it takes. 
God, I wish my, my prayer time was two or three hours. I, I mean, I, I, wish I, I, I wish I could please God in every way of my life. Uh, the, the spirit in me is willing, but the flesh is a real problem. It gets in the way all the time. And Jesus calls the disciples on that. He, he says, your, your spirit is willing, your spirit's in the right place, but your flesh is weak. Well, how, how do we fix that, church? Galatians 5.16 says that if we walk in the spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We will not succumb to self-indulgence and the weaknesses of the flesh. Okay, so we've got to walk in the spirit. How is that done? That is accomplished through our time with the Lord through prayer. And it does not come any other way. I'll make you a promise. If you took no time to pray over this last week, you spent your last week in the power of the flesh. Now, you might have gave it your best shot, but you were not operating under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. There is a big difference. And it only comes through that time spent with God. So Jesus understood the danger was very great and imminent for the disciples. I mean, they, he knew that Peter himself was going to be in danger of denying he even knew Christ. He's looking at Peter, your, flesh, your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. You need to take time to watch and pray. This is really important that you walk in the spirit over these next 24 hours, guys. But they're too tired. They don't take his advice, and we know what happened. They all scattered. They all ran away. Peter denies them. And in the same way, church, we are in a time that is very dangerous. Did you know that the Bible tells us that during this time where we can anticipate the return of Christ, that there will be a great falling away that happens in the church? Right in the church. People sitting in the pews are going to fall away. The church is going to fall away out of favor with God. Completely miss the purposes of God. Get wrapped up in stuff that doesn't even matter to the point where God says, this might be a church building, but this ain't my church. A great falling away is coming. And Jesus would say, watch and pray that you're not a part of that. Stay spiritually alert. Understand the significance of the eternal in the midst of the temporal life that you're living. Why don't you pray with me for one hour? Watch and pray. We must be a church that is aware of the dangers that we face. Finally, in verse 42... My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Travailing prayer leads to a place of surrender, and we'll talk about that more next week, that we might be used by God to accomplish His will, no matter what the personal cost is. We need to be a people who offer God on a regular basis, God, use me for your glory, no matter the personal cost to myself today. That's called dying to yourself. We ought to do that on a daily basis. Get out of bed. Spend a little time with God and let Him know, God, today I want to bring you glory. And I'm willing to bring you glory no matter what the scale of personal cost to myself is. Use me. Pour me out in that way. May my life be poured out for your glory. Jesus had the Spirit. And He says, Your will be done. Isn't this a prayer we're to be praying on a regular basis? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, in my life as it is in heaven. I mean, this is supposed to be part of the model prayer that Jesus gave to us. We're supposed to be in familiar territory when we pray for God's will to be done over our own. Jesus set that out as, a, as an example, as a model prayer. He prayed this all the time. It's no shock to Him. It's nothing new in His prayer life that He would tell the Father, your will be done. That's what's most important to me, Father, that your will be done. So I find it interesting that he says here, if this cannot pass unless I drink it. Let's understand something, church, here. There's, there's an interesting dynamic that's happening right here. You ever wonder, we've talked about this a bunch, but I want to I dive into it just a little bit why Jesus had to die on the cross. Like, it was not an option. And I'm even going to say this morning, it was, more than, it was more than just about you. There was more on the line when it came to the cross. Jesus, in this prayer, now God the Father, when He talks to us, 
When he talks to me and when he talks to you, he'll point to the cross and say, that was a demonstration of my love for you. Right? That's that Romans 5.8. But when Jesus is praying, I want you to understand it was God's glory he was most concerned about. We didn't make it into this prayer. Now, now I don't doubt that Jesus loved us very, very much. But Jesus had the holiness of God in mind. Here was the issue. God was finding favor with rebels and letting them into heaven. How can he maintain his holiness and righteousness and justice? See, it's his character that's on the line here. It began in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. This is where the problem is. We carry it on, but let me just read this to you. Very simple. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You must surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. We know how this story turned out. Chapter 3 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. This this is the beginning of the problem. Man rebelled against God. What was the what was the the consequences? Death. Now sometimes we we are a little hard on God because we tell, we say, we object that the of the consequences of our sin, but he told us right out of the gates. We do this, we die. And he showed mercy. Adam and Eve did not drop dead on the spot. But death was immediate. They were clothed in animal skins. See, Jesus went to to the cross here because now God has a problem with his character. Number one, let me just talk about a couple character points and then I'm going to close. Number one, God is sovereign. And that means that he has all authority. God has all authority. He created all things. He knows all things. He sustains all things. He owns all things. We belong to God, and He has absolute authority over our lives. Do you understand that, church? And we have rebelled against His authority. We have, a, we have denounced it. We've rebelled against Him. We did it in Genesis 2 and 3, and we've done it in Romans, 6, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned against God. We've all done the same thing. We are rebels against a holy God. We have rejected His sovereignty. You might be sovereign over all things, God, but not over, all my, not over my life. I'll do what I want to do. Well, this brings us to a problem. We've rejected His sovereignty. Well, God is righteous. God is righteous. That just simply means everything God does is right. Everything. He's never had a wrong thought. He's never done a wrong action. He's never said a wrong word. This is all part of the character Of God. He's never done anything wrong. But we have despised and rejected God's righteousness. There was there is no one righteous. No, not even one. There is none who understands. There are none who seeks God. We have altogether fallen away and become worthless. We are the complete opposite of God's righteousness. We have rejected God's righteousness. We've rejected His sovereignty and we've rejected His righteousness. Well, this brings me to God's wrath, another one of His attributes. This has to do with God's judgment. Because He's holy and righteous, He hates sin. So let me say it this way. Because God's wrath, because God's judgment is based in His righteousness, the wrath of God being poured out on sin is not just a probability. It is a, an, an, a, it's a certainty. It's going to happen. It's based on who he is. It's an inevitability. John 3, 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has life, but whoever does not obey the Son will not see life because the wrath of God remains on him. God's wrath is deserved. It's final. It's terrible. It's eternal. It's a serious thing. And we have disregarded God's wrath. Talk about God's wrath to people today. They'll mock it. They'll kick back against it. They'll question His judgment. We'll ignore His warnings. 
Our society is no longer concerned with the wrath of God. I wish we could just get the church to be concerned with the wrath of God. But it's a real part. So we've rejected his sovereignty, his righteousness, and his wrath. Now here's the good part. God, God is love. It's part of his character. God loves us and it affects everything that he does. Right? That's that John 3.16. That's why he sent Christ to help fix the problem. Here's the problem. Proverbs 17.15. Write that in your margin. Acquitting the guilty and condemning the righteousness, both are detestable to the Lord. Acquitting the guilty and condemning the righteous, both are detestable to the Lord. So here's the question of the Bible. How do sinners not receive a guilty verdict? You know, that's the part, that's the question, that's the objection that this Bible spends so much time on. It's what this Bible has a problem with. The Bible has a problem with God giving sinners like us who deserve a guilty verdict. It has a problem with the verdict that we do get. We get acquitted. We don't get that guilty verdict. You know, that's very revealing when it comes to the heart of man because I've never wrestled with people (laughs) over this predicament. I've never had someone sit in my office, cross their arms, and say, Pastor, I've got a real problem with God. I don't see how he can send someone as sinful as me to be punished for my sins. Or, I don't see how he can send someone who is as sinful as me into heaven without being punished for my sins. I've got a real problem with that. Never had anyone say that to me. Now, people have a problem with saying, uh, Pastor, I've got a problem with God saying he's going to punish sinners. Who does he think he is? Isn't it very revealing? The Bible spends no time on that. The Bible wonders, how can a holy God, a righteous God, a sovereign God, a God of perfect justice, how can he take sinful rebels and grant them access into heaven? Jesus headed to the cross so that God's wrath could pass over us and it could be placed on him. See, that's what the cross was really about. And that, that teaching is called propitiation. So you can learn a big word today. That's when God takes the wrath that, was, that should have been placed on us and it passes over us and it's satisfied in Jesus instead. See, on that cross was the single point where God's sovereignty and God's wrath and God's righteousness and God's holiness and God's love, all of it was satisfied at one single moment in time when his wrath fell on Jesus. Jesus died to protect the holiness of God, the character of God. They planned on it from the very beginning, and the reason they did it, the reason God came up with this plan was because of his love for us. Sinful rebels given access into the kingdom of heaven blows the minds of angels. And we take it for granted. Jesus went to that cross to satisfy all these attributes of God. That's why he prayed with such intensity. That's why Jesus said, your will be done. If I must drink from this cup, your will be done and not mine. So as we close here this morning, church, let me ask you, when you think of the the verse from John 3.36, those who have believed in the Son have life but those who do not obey the Son will not see life because the wrath of God remains on them. Where do you fall in that camp? And I like how the Bible divides that. You either believe or you're not obeying. It's one or the other. Our belief is demonstrated in our behavior. If you believe you are obeying. This is the love of God, that you obey my commandments, that you keep my commandments. If you say you believe in Christ and have a saving faith, it's demonstrated in your life. But the Bible says if you do not obey him, the wrath of God remains on you. You have not been transformed from the inside out. You have not yet been uh, changed by what Jesus did on the cross. This travailing prayer preserves the glory of God and fulfills 
the plan from the very beginning of the creation of this world to redeem our souls. Every one of us is a sinner, and God can't let sinful rebels into heaven and remain just without coming through the cross. Have you come through the cross? Will you be given access to heaven based on the work of Jesus on the cross? And Christians, as we're closing, I I just want you to take a moment to think about this question. Does your prayer life reflect that of a sleeper? Or have you learned to travail in prayer? Do your prayer, is it the cry of your soul, of your heart? Are you seeking for the will of God to be done? Are you consumed by the eternal and not stuck in the temporal? Or do you just constantly seek the hands of God for what He can give to you? Do you have two and three minute prayers and that's about the maximum? That's the extent of your prayer life. Could it be that right now before the return of Christ, it's so close that you're nodding off just like the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane were? God, wake us up that we would be ready when Christ returns. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the demonstration of Christ that he left with us. What what prayer was intended to be. And Father, it's not always about what Jesus was going through. Drops of sweat like blood. Certainly this was a prayer based in agony. But you have called us to be a people who walk with you who have intimacy with you, have an intimate knowledge of who you are based on the time that we've spent with you. We're to be a people who seek you. We're to be a people who are moved in the heart. Who are not satisfied to to claim with our lips that we have a relationship with you, but never spend time with you. God, let us take warning this morning. We do not want to be as the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane were who are overcome by their flesh, who are stuck, blinded to the significance of the eternal. But Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, that we would understand the days in which we live and how important it is that in these last moments we would introduce as many people as possible, that they would have the opportunity to have a rich personal relationship with you, God, And we understand that comes through knowing Christ. Use us that others might come to know you. Help us to be consumed with your will and not our own. Give us a heart to pray, God. Wake us up if we are sleeping. We want to know you more at a deeper level. Teach us to pray. We ask that just like the early disciples did. Don't let us get stuck in casual prayer. Teach us to pray, God. And Father, I thank you so much that Jesus went to the cross. I understand that your holiness was on the line. You put everything on the line so that someone like me, a rebellious sinner, a rebel, would be given the chance to enter into heaven. God, thank you for that. Holy Spirit, I pray that as you're in this place, you would convict hearts that those who need to surrender completely to the call of the gospel, that they would die to themselves and live for you, that that would become abundantly clear right now. And Father, I pray that you would wake your church up, that they might pray, and that we would have an eternal impact in our community and around this world. Church, right now, I just want you to to listen Invite the Spirit to speak to your heart. As you walk out of this place today, what does God want to do with what you've heard? What has He spoken to you? What do you need to do in response to the message today? Make sure that you obey. If you need to obey the command of the gospel here this morning, I want you to know That God is after you. He is pursuing you. He loves you. And his wrath is real. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We will stand before God and give an answer for all that we have done and said and thought. Our attitudes, 
our motivations will all be exposed. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, the Bible says. But we are giving the opportunity to have all of our rebellious deeds and actions wiped clean from our account if we will only place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if we will only confess to God our sinfulness that He might forgive us and place His Spirit within us and teach us to walk in the power of His Spirit. He'll transform you this morning. He'll save your soul from His wrath. If He's speaking to your heart in that way this morning, would you just cry out to Him right now? Not from a prayer of your lips, but from a prayer from your heart. God, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I am among the rebellious sinners that have no reason they ought to be admitted entrance into heaven. But you have moved on my behalf anyhow. You sent Jesus to die for my sin. And right now I understand the weight of that action. God, I ask you to forgive the sin in my life, to wash me clean by the blood of Christ that was shed for me on the cross. I place my faith and trust in Jesus alone. With all the faith that I have, I place it in Christ. Jesus, come and be my Lord and Savior today. Come live in my heart. Holy Spirit, fill me that I might live for you and walk in your power. God, I want to know you and I want to come into your family into your kingdom. Save me, God. The eyes of the Spirit are looking through this place today. I just want to give you an opportunity. If you prayed that prayer from the bottom of your heart today, friend, if you just invited God to do a saving work in your soul with no one looking around but the eyes of the Lord in this place, would you just place your hand up in the air as a way to indicate before God, God, I just meant every word that I just said. God, thank you for saving my soul. Any hands going up here this morning? Would you put them up high so that I can see them? Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else here this morning? Would you just place your hand up high? Thank you. Thank you in the back. Anyone else? God, thank you for saving my soul this morning. I place my hand high in the air, recognizing that you've done a work in my life here this morning. Anyone else? Well, Father, we, f- we thank you for these two that have responded to the, to the gospel. And God, as we close today, I pray that you would challenge us to step up as your disciples and to pray, watch and pray as Jesus has asked us to do. Reveal your heart to us, God, as we seek to be a people that seeks your face, not just your hands. We love you, Lord. Thank you for challenging us and working in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.